that as you watch the following circle happen, you may not be physically with us, but just in watching, you are a participant. The question extends out beyond the people who you're going to hear from, but extends out to those people who are listening and thinking. That's the practice. It's a practice of listening. And so please um, come with us. Stop the analysis and be present because what that will do is it'll give you a real feel for what you should expect in the quality of the circles that you will continually be working in um, over time this year. So welcome. I want to uh, say that we're here to practice. We're here to be part of a talking circle, um, which is a cultural practice across the globe and across communities um, where we come and gather. And so we're here today to get to know each other, to talk, to be open, and to come and be present without distraction. Um, one of the reasons that a circle is such a universal um, place of counsel is because we face each other. There's nothing in between us right now. And we need to come with that intention that we're going to be OK being face to face with each other. Um, and we're going to be OK to listen and take in and give what we can. The other thing that uh, I want to make sure that we understand is there's a couple of um, ceremonial aspects to this. Um, one is we sit facing each other in a circle, right? Uh, the other part is there's a talking piece. For logistical purposes of today, we are going to be using the microphone. Like I said earlier, this is not the traditional piece that I would bring, but think of it as an amplifier of your voice and of your truth. Um, and that we're going to hold it close to our hearts as we speak. One of the things kids talk about is their favorite. And we often ask them, what's your favorite ice cream? What's your favorite, you know, color? Um, I'm going to ask, what's your favorite number? And why? And this is where I'm going to get you started on your story. So the intention of the icebreaker is an icebreaker to get us here and centered. So let's do a little reveal, huh? So, what's your number? Ooh, ooh. So immediately we can see some connection. So I'm going to stop talking now. And we'll just start. So please, um, what is the story of your favorite number? Why is this the number you chose to share? I chose the number two, um, and that's because I had two children, two mm. grandchildren. And one of the things I always think about is I have two hands, and, and the reason I had two children was because I wanted to always keep them safe, and I could keep one hand for each child. I'm Denise. I chose two. And I just think of it like in terms of people and how you, know, you can be alone and do all that stuff, but if you have somebody by your side or you're in pairs or you're doing work, it's always better to be around people. And so um, you know, I grew up with one brother, there were two of us. It's always nice to be in a crowd, but I think as long as you can boil it down and you have somebody by your side, you can do a lot more things in a better way. Um, and so I just like two. I chose 15. Um, 15. 15 is the age that I decided that I was going to change my life. 15 is when I decided that I was going to move forward that I was going to take control from some fairly toxic scenarios, um, some toxic mental health. 15 is also uh, the age where we took in our foster, my niece. And 15 is probably the age where my daughter, on her own, took control of her life. As part of what we'll move into next and stories, um, we're going to just do a community circle. And what a community circle means is essentially that we're, we're continuing this getting to know each other. There is no resolution that has to come from this. There is no decision that has to come from this. This is about us um, creating a, a discussion, a platform for discussion. So as we start this process, there are a few questions that I have up here. And I want you to answer with whatever questions you feel like sharing from, or whatever comes to your heart. 
and this moment. This is my first time formally participating in a circle, um, but I totally understand with the gathering around in the kitchen. Um, I have kids and I've really been intentional to try to be a good mom. I have three kids um, and two are no longer at home, but we that's the family gathering spot, uh, whether you're sitting, standing, whatever. Um, and now sort of in the electronic age, sometimes we do the group texting thing, which really <laughs> seems like a distorted circle, but it works, I mean. <laughs> Um, and it's and we're all online and we're all you have to listen because you can only receive messages so much and read so um, mm -hmm. we make that work for the modern age so the the people who knew me the best as a kid I have th uh, three female cousins who were all born in the same year I was born in 1964 and we um, you know I, I'm it's we're I have 36 cousins, so us three would spend every summer together. One week at one person's house, one week at the other. And they knew me best. I knew them best. It's something we've done up until we graduated and, the, and uh, everything. And it's funny because whenever we get together for family reunions, we all like get together and just sit in a little circle. And so we went through a lot of tough times together. But it was really, we still are a unit. And I think for me, I'm a social worker as well. So probably for me, circles came up in graduate school. Um, and being able to kind of really have those kind of therapeutic conversations and those safe spaces. And then I worked in a day treatment program first out of college. And so really bringing it to students when we were really talking about some pretty tough situations that they were going through and how we could help support each other and really build that community because our classrooms were only um, 10 students and there were four staff. So we were a pretty small, tight-knit community. But being able to bring that to them and give them a, a sense of belonging somewhere um, where they had never really had that before. So. Uh, my mom probably knew me the best, and I knew her the best. Um, as far back as I can remember, she was always in and out of a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> my dad, <coughs> excuse me. And sister just didn't get it. So we knew each other well. Um, probably visiting her was a safe spot mm. just because she was safe. Um, There was a park across the street, we called it the Army Camp, so Sandlot Baseball was very good. Um, mm -hmm. Played that a lot. Outdoors is good for me too. I grew up in the Central District of Seattle, and at that time, it was a community. It felt like a community. <laughs> I literally could say that neighborhood was my circle because I could room in that community and feel like if I did anything wrong, <laughs> my mom will know about it. <laughs> um, there was no way of getting around from literally Cherry all the way to probably Jackson. That's how far it stretched. Um, and it was pretty wide. My friends that were in my neighborhood, Lola was like my best friend. Um, the other place that was safe for me was always around music. And so music was kind of the expression at the time, uh, 70s and 80s. And uh, where I'd be out in the community, you know, experiencing whatever I was gonna experience, whether it be good or bad, I know I could always come home to music and my favorite music and so that's connected to the first circles that I experienced were around the, the African drum so I was I wasn't the best in, in our African drum ensemble but I actually had a uh, an expression I had I had a beat that I was supposed to hold and uh, people around me were even, some were better some maybe not as good but we all had our place and it was done in a circle Later, um, in my late teens, I, 
I fell off a cliff, I got paralyzed, and, um, and that really kind of shifted my thinking. I, I realized I had lost something, and I wanted to um, not volunteer anything else to be lost in my life. So I kind of, well, I met a friend who didn't care that I was gay, and it, it wasn't an issue for her, and um, she kind of forced me to say it out loud, and I realized it just, it was only an issue in Utah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I moved here, and nobody really cares that much. Um, and anyway, and now I find belonging a lot with my friendships. Um, my classroom at school is always the classroom that has the coffee pot. And that's kind of our unconventional circle time with uh, <laughs> teaching staff. And we come in, and we share successes and challenges and frustrations with students and staff and families and life. And um, yeah, and I, I feel like I have that sense of belonging back. Part of coming home was, um, you know, uh, going into the board conference room uh, for one of my first meetings and discovering there's a picture of Asian American women there and it was a plaque dedicated to them winning social justice here in Seattle public schools in the wake of uh, World War II. So five of the women are the clericals who actually got compensation for being fired after Pearl Harbor. But one of the women in front was the activist who actually got them their justice, which happened to be Cherry Kenosha, my mom. And so you can imagine what an experience that was to discover that. Uh, obviously, it was a little bit distracting. I was supposed to be, you know, minding my business here, working with the board. But uh, it was just another reminder of uh, the little voice you have in your head uh, that somebody says, she always said, you know, uh, speak up. Don't just kind of stand there or sit there, do something. And so uh, that was kind of her legacy to me. Um, and so in reflection, what's that value that that person who made you feel belonging, what did they pass to you? What's that value they held that made you admire them or look at them in that way? Clear? Okay. If we're ready? <laughs> what I learned is not to sit next to you yeah. first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a responsibility right It there. is, yes. Um, so um, my folks um, didn't grow up being rich, and, and so our circle time and what I learned from my mom was um, that I needed to be very grateful, very humble, because not everybody was as lucky, and, and, and they talked about that. So our, our um, learning was uh, sharing and caring. So I mm. needed to share and care because not everybody else is as lucky as we are. So I hope that I take that to my grandkids um, and as well as all other children. So I guess I would say I grew up a really shy kid. Like I didn't talk in school. I didn't do a lot of that stuff. I'm very much an introvert. But what I did learn is through lessons of watching my parents and them navigating school systems and mainstream society and all that kind of stuff and my grandmother and all those things is that we innately have a fierceness that builds confidence. You just have to be able to embrace that and plow through a lot of fear and find courage in really hard situations. And then once you do that, you know, you build the confidence around. And so, you know, when I go into classrooms and I see the shy kids sitting in the back, I know what their potential is and that we need to find places for them to be able to speak up and find their voice in safe places that build that confidence over time. Um, my mom always said, own what you have. She said she owned her mental illness. Mental illness didn't own her. And I practice that with my students, our boys and girls, is that just own who you are. You know, take advantage of your greatness. Um, there's no shortcomings. You, you can be whatever you want to be. And just there's going to be some challenges, but just own the challenge. Uh, I think that the learning that I carry forward is uh, what I would encourage uh, myself and other adults to do in the system is to extend grace and ensure those around you and yourself are experiencing joy. My father took the time um, to help me believe that I had a life that just was um, 
it made me feel confident about the potential in my life. Um, and that's a magical thing. And I hope that for, for young people. What I hope is that as adults, we take the time to step back and listen. Because what you'll find is that kids are even more open to this process. And they do it all the time. They do it on the playground. They do it at their tables. They have circle that we're not invited to quite yet. So hopefully we can bring a little bit of that naturalized belonging by being vulnerable and sharing our value and speaking our story. Because now I know everyone in this room much better and most of you I just met an hour and a half ago. So thank you.